This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for Flames fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. And we're back with an interesting week for the Flames, currently in the middle of a game where the Flames are 5 nothing over Vegas. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk Flames hockey again. Matt, uh, what do you think of these goals so far in the Vegas game? Well, the first line's sure putting on a show, and it's a departure from last year when Vegas was the team to beat, it seems, and now we're taking our revenge, I guess. Well, wasn't it the last game of the season last year Vegas stomped all over us? I think so. Wasn't it like 7-1 or something? Uh, that sounds right. Well, we'll get back to Vegas. Uh, let's start at the beginning of the week. Let's go back to the the game the Calgary Flames played coming back after their California road trip here at the Dome on Thursday against Montreal. And I think the score in this one doesn't reflect this game. Montreal won 3-2. to two. Mike Smith was in net, and I think this is the worst performance we've seen from Smitty. I was saying to you before we started recording, I think this game finally seals Smitty's fate that he's no longer the starter here. Yeah. Uh, you can't put up a goalie performance like that and expect to remain a reliable starter in the league. Like, that's it. Like, you can have a bad game. Like, even, like, Patrick Waugh had a bad game when he was with Montreal and gave up nine goals to Detroit, which also prompted him to get traded. But it was the nature of the goals. Like, especially the, that game-winning goal. Like, any goaltender, beer league and up, should stop that. And it got through, and that cost the Flames the game. The other two, the second one was an all right goal against. The first one was equally bad. If he was even like two feet further out instead of being on the goal line, that's an easy routine save. But because he was so deep, it bounced off him and in. Like it just, it's frustrating to see, you know, and I'm sure it's frustrating for the players when a goaltender gives up goals on easy shots like it's not even like they're getting high quality dangerous chances like i don't even think montreal had a dangerous scoring chance in the entire game and yet they scored three times and it you just it's deflating for the entire team because you're trying your best i think the flames had like 42 shots or something like that in the game and you're giving up goals like that like you just it you can't have that and the Flames, I think, will have to f- have Smith work with the goalie coach while Riddick gets a bunch of starts for the next couple weeks and hope that he can rebuild his game where he can be an NHL-caliber goaltender because, frankly, that was not NHL-caliber goaltending. You know, I said this to you earlier, um, and I've mentioned this online a few times on Twitter and whatnot. I'm wondering if Smitty is still hurt. I mean, we we know that he went out early or late last year with a lower body injury, and even when he came back, he didn't look great. He was the best we had, but he still didn't look like, you know, the Smitty we saw before that. So I'm wondering if I've mentioned to you that he's slow. Maybe it's a, a groin injury you suggested. Maybe there's something going on with his knees. I don't know exactly what the injury is, but maybe he's still hurt. Yeah, uh, he. you've mentioned before that he's looked slow in his appearances, and it's hard for a goaltender to be effective. Like, he's a good goaltender. Like it, It's just that he's not putting himself in positions where he's able to make what should be routine saves. And part of that's confidence, and part of that's just, I guess, like, poor focus? I don't know. Like, it... Like, that goal, the especially the third one, that was a horrible goal. Like, that may be the single worst goal I've ever seen anybody score in the NHL. Period. And, like, that includes ones from 200 feet away, because most of the times, those bounce. The third Montreal goal, the Jonathan Drouin one? No. Or, sorry, the, the uh, Letkinen one. Yeah, the Letkinen one. 
and where it was just a weak wrist shot from the face-off dot. Like, that's a routine save. Like, that's the type of shot that Lekkonen was doing there was, here, I'm giving the puck to the goalie so he'll make the save so I can get off the ice and we can get a line change. Like, there's no intent to score on that shot. That was just literally to get a face-off. And, like, he looked surprised that it went in. Yeah, I think everybody in the building was surprised that that went in. And if you're having a shot like that go in, and in the, the time that it went in, like, you could get away with that if it was, like, in the first five minutes of the game, and then, okay, let's bounce back, let's go. But when it's a tie game and there's less than ten minutes to go, it's like, what else is this guy going to give up? If you're on the bench. And it just, it throws the entire team out of sequence. And that Smith, frankly, Smith, until he can show in practice that he is capable again, frankly, I give the net to Reddick for the foreseeable future. And the other thing that worries me about, um, about Smitty's speed, he likes to wander. And every time he wanders now, it's like, you know, we've already gotten trouble because he's wandered before and they put a puck in. And now with him looking even slower, it's like, stay in the net, old man. I, I know. And it's frustrating because you got to know that it's frustrating for him. Because he's used to doing hit things and being successful. He's an all-star goalie. It, and, like, I think that what you said about him being hurt is true. It's just that the Flames can't tank their season by having a guy working through this kind of stuff on a regular basis. And I guess the only reason I'm surprised if he was hurt is we saw a lot of Flames, including Monaghan, who sort of, you know, got the surgery and got the rehab over the summer. And I'd be surprised if the Flames didn't make him do the same. And I don't believe they wouldn't have known. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe it just feels different. I mean, you know, that injury was... He's getting older, and maybe the injury just slowed him down. We see that with old guys, too. Yeah, and it's unfortunate, but it does happen. Like, you look at a guy like Tanner Pearson, who was traded this week, and he was a great player, had 24 goals one year, got injured, broke his leg, and hasn't been the same player since. And that's why he was traded for basically a cap dump. And, you know, it... Things like that do happen, unfortunately, and hopefully over the next week or two, he can work a lot with Siglet to get where he needs to be, and hopefully his next appearance, he has some success and can hopefully rebuild some of the confidence that he had, but for now, you just have to roll with Riddick and hope that he can hold the fort until everything else gets sorted out with the bat backup goaltender situation because frankly until that happens like the flames are kind of stuck with just one goaltender for right now and especially well, let's, you know let's come back to riddick i want to have a discussion there but let's talk about the battle of alberta first shall we this is why the flames had a good week it wasn't because of what they're doing in vegas with vegas right now it's the fact that they beat glenn gulletson and the edmonton oilers that uh, that would make if the, that was one of the only points we got this week, I'd consider it a good week. You're still a happy man. Yep. The Flames got down early in this one. First goal of the game from former Flame Alex Chase on, and then Connor McDavid popped one in late in the third. Derek Ryan followed up to make it two to one, and in the third, Lindholm got two goals, which ended up sealing the Flames uh, deal here four to two over the Oilers, which we got to be happy with. Yep. As happy as we are, though, I thought there was a lot of problems with this game. And I was noticing that first goal, that uh, that chase on goal, really made everybody in red look bad. Yeah. And the whole first, well, the and, whole first period, they didn't look good. Well, frankly, any time that Alex chase on scores, your team should feel bad. <laughs> yeah, I found that whole first period, the Flames didn't have great puck management. It seemed like they were sort of not going out there and playing the way they needed to. And so many times in the first, and probably I'd even say the first half of the second, they were doing the thing I've been complaining about for years. They finally had a man in front, but his stick wasn't on the ice. I don't know how many times I saw we'd get a pass out front, and it would go right by the guy in front of the net. It's like, put your stick on the ice. They teach five-year-olds that. I know. And uh, frankly, the Flames seemed out of sorts, and I do have to give credit to the Oilers. They did 
have a good start to the game. And their talented players were a nuisance. And, like, Ryan Spooner was actually noticeable in a game for a change. Uh, well, when you go to Edmonton, you're going to be noticeable. There's not much there. Yeah, true. And that leads to the second point, that if uh, the Oilers were better, the Flames don't win. But because of the fact they have zero depth beyond the dry side of the line, at, with McDavid, they're going to lose a lot of games because of the fact that they just don't have anybody else. And the Flames did a good job, and I mean, McDavid got one goal, but they did a really good job of you know mitigating Edmonton's limited firepower. Well, I think that has more to do with the coaching staff putting Milan Lucic on that first line than anything, because you know you, you want to shut down McDavid, you just have to get Lucic out there, and you, you're good to go. Yeah, I, I can see why they did it, and it did become a physical game. I think it was, you know, a little bit of protection out there. But, yeah, I don't know. It was a weird choice. Yeah. Wouldn't have been me, but, you know. <laughs> some, some really physical play I found, too, from maybe two unlikely guys. I thought Bennett and Backland were maybe two of the most physical flames here. They were the ones that ended up paying for it, at least, sitting in the box a few times. Yeah. That hit by Sam Bennett on Darnell Nurse, that was a beauty of a hit. It like was. If he can do that regularly... And, like, man, everybody on the opposition is going to have to keep their head up because of the fact that he just came right across the ice and nailed Nurse. And, like, I don't even think Nurse was expecting to get hit quite that hard. Nope. No, I don't think so. But, yeah, good to see that, you know, there's a little bit of everything in this game. And good to see the Flames were able to put come back in the third and say, and give him a little bit of put a little bit of effort into it. And on that point, we have some audio here from Elias Lindholm, who is talking about what's working so far for the team in the third period. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to tell. I think uh, we have a lot of skill and we're a fast team. And, uh, you know, uh, for now it works to, to be down in third. But, you know, uh, I think we, we just talk before the third to, to give it all and, you know, play better. And uh, a lot of times we, we, we played uh, unreal in the third and, but, uh, you know, you don't want to chase the game too much. and um, It's not going to work all the time to, to, to be down in uh, before the third. So uh, something that it works. So, Matt, I mean, he's right. You know, they came back in the third and won the game. But as we've talked about, this isn't sustainable. This team's got to come out early. And we're seeing that tonight in Vegas, which we'll talk about in a minute. But they gotta they got to stop coming back in the third period here. It's all about good habits. Like, you look at the Oilers in their season thus far. Like, last night they lost to Vegas in the, very much the same fashion that they lost to Calgary. And they come out very strong in their games, and then they choke in the third periods frequently. And where Calgary, it's like the Flames almost seem to be not sure how to play the system entirely yet. And so they're kind of more reacting to the opposition for the first period and a half, two periods. And then it's like, oh, we know how to do it now. And then they just, you know, tear the opposition to shreds. And I think that, like, once the Flames get a little more comfortable with how they play their game, that I think you'll start seeing more good starts right off the bat instead of... Because if you look at how the teams played, the Flames are one of the top teams in the league. And if not for some shoddy goaltending from uh, Mike Smith, like the Flames could have six or eight more points in the standings and be right up there in the top tier uh, with Tampa Bay and Toronto. So it's one of those situations where it's like they're getting there. And like if you look at the amount of talent on the team, they're despite being out of sorts a little bit in like especially with their defensive coverage because we've seen t way too many odd man rushes to start this season like Riddick had to stop three breakaways in the Oilers game that once like th those defensive breakdowns and miscues stop and the team is on the right page with each other I think you'll see the Flames start dominating teams from start to finish. Before we leave this game, I have one more piece of uh, dressing room audio here. This is Sam Bennett talking about how he thought this game felt like a playoff game. Yeah, I, I think that was uh, yeah, one of the most intense games we played against them. And, um, I think it's, uh, it's a little taste of uh, you know what playoff hockey's like. So um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great rivalry, and I'm sure 
and next time we play them, it's going to be more of the same. Well, Matt, it would be kind of fun if this was a preview of the playoffs. As much as you know, you and I don't think Edmonton's going to make it, it's always fun to see the Battle of Alberta in the postseason. Yeah. Uh, the Oilers, if they were to make it, it would be, frankly, a shock just due to the fact that they have like only four NHL forwards right now. But it did. With all the chippiness and stuff like that, it did feel like a playoff game. Oh, for sure. And it was a very feisty and interesting game to watch. And the next game, uh, we're recording while this game is going. Uh, Actually, uh, I want to add one more thing. Sure. Boy, I would hate if Matthew Kachuk was not a flame. Oh, man. I could understand why the Edmonton fans were so ticked off with him. Uh, He is just so good at getting under the opposition's skin. Like, that... That was an amazing performance of how to be a dick in the NHL because he just, like, wow. (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, when was the last time you saw a player of his caliber who can be both the offensive dynamo that he is and have that physical, you know, grinder, gritty game that he's got? Well, like, he he drew 26 minutes in penalty off of Hendrick. Or, no, well... Cassian? Cassian, there you go. And, like, there was that scrum where he was punching Drysidle out. And, you know, like, if I was, if he wasn't a flame, like, that would be, like, the hardest player. Like, we all hate Ryan Kessler and Corey Perry and those type of guys, but Kachuk's on a whole different level than those guys. And, <laughs> you know. Thank like, goodness Brady's not in our division. Yeah. Well, now you understand why I was so interested in trading for him in the last draft, even though he didn't have a first-round pick. In a game like that, though, if we had two Kachucks doing that, all hell would have broken loose. <laughs> That'd be just awesome. You got one of them beaten on Drysaddle and the other one beaten on McDavid, and I yeah. think all hell would break loose on the ice. <laughs> oh, yeah. It would be great hockey, though. <laughs> you could revive the Bash brothers. Yeah, should we look at this Vegas game, man? Sure. Uh, the Flames are playing Las Vegas in Calgary. This is on Monday night, and we're recording in progress. It's uh, 15.02 in the second, and as we talked about earlier, the Flames need to get an early start. They're up 7 nothing now, uh, 15.02 in the second. There was just a, a goal by Sam Bennett. So I guess the question is going to be, who's not going to score tonight for Calgary? Um, maybe Mike Smith. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, at this point, maybe. At this point, you can put Smitty in for the last five minutes, just see if he can hold down the fort. And the Flames lose. It's a, no. <laughs> um, I'm surprised Subban's still in for a seven-goal shelling so far. Well, it's not fair to him, but, you know, they need to give Flurry the night off, and unfortunately, sometimes backups get mauled. Uh, like, we both remember when guys like McElhinney and Irving would – stink it up when they'd get the, their odd start and it is what it is like at this point like it doesn't matter the game whether the flames win 15 nothing or 7 to 4 it doesn't matter so why bother burning the other guy so Matt we'll come back to this game at the end of the show but I think right now for the sake of our predictions game we're going to call this a win I I I think that might be safe to say. If we bungle a 7 nothing lead. I think that'd be a historic in NHL history, frankly. Like, if we screw this one up, the Flames are known to sometimes get big leads and mess it up. If we blow this lead, shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, from how I, we've been watching the game, like, that's just not going to happen. Vegas seems like a dead team on the ice, Yeah, frankly. Well, let's... They're, they're certainly not last year's Vegas Golden Knights. I think everybody's adjusted to how they play the game now. And the, Vegas is where an expansion team should be. Near the bottom. Yeah. Uh, well, let's take a look at where that puts the Flames right now. Right now, they're 7th in the West with 23 points. And 2nd in the Pacific with 23 points. So they've got San Jose and above them and Vancouver below them. So kind of right where you and I expect. Does that include, does that include the Vegas game? No. Why don't you add that just for 
kicks because sure well is uh san jose's not playing so they are 25 so i put us to 25 points we'd be tied for first in the pacific um and then in the west we would be again 25 so we would jump to uh winnipeg's playing so it depends how winnipeg does but we'll either be four let's say fourth or third uh in the in the west not bad depending on how winnipeg does so, yeah, looking pretty good. I kind of wish I was at the Dome to watch this shellacking tonight. I think that's the official term we used after the Penguins game. So we have to re- reuse the same term here. Well, the Flames need one more, and then between the two games, we're even. Tonight, though, we are the shellackers, not the shellackies. Yeah. Is that the official term? I don't know. Um, those who shellack? Who cares? Yeah. Anyway... Uh, we were talking about Riddick earlier, and he is in net again for this Vegas game. So far, he's working on a shutout. This is the second time this year that he's had two games in a row as a starter. And as you and I talked about a little bit earlier, I think this is the start of David Riddick playing starter minutes. And I've talked about this a few times already. we got to get him in the net and get him playing starter minutes. I think you're going to see Riddick probably play most of the games. We pl- pretty much play every other until December 8th when it's a Nashville-Edmonton back-to-back. And I think you're probably going to see Riddick play, let's say, four of the next six at least and get those starter minutes. I wouldn't even be shocked if it was more like five of six or six of six even, just to give Smith some additional time to sort himself out. But uh, Well, we got, we got Winnipeg Wednesday. I can see him playing against Winnipeg. Yeah. We go to Vegas where we can shellac again. Wouldn't it be awesome if we... Back if we to back, get, yeah. Yeah, like 7 nothing again in Vegas. Um, then we go to Arizona. I would put him in for that one. Dallas, maybe. And then, of course, you put him in against L.A. I don't even know who's Tenny Net in L.A. anymore, the the Zamboni driver. Yeah. They're out of goalies. Um, Chicago, Columbus, Minnesota, Nashville. I maybe wouldn't put him in against Nashville, but um, I think he's good. there's a good run here where you can get Riddick into a lot of games. Yeah, I agree. And I think that... That'll help build his confidence, especially because a lot of those teams are a little on the weaker side. So, like, if he can, like, say, like, with Vegas tonight, they, they're they not very good. So, you know. You don't say. And you look at a lot of the other teams, and, like, they're just not very good. So he can build some confidence to be the starter by being able to just stop the mediocre teams. Yeah, and I think even against the good teams, I mean, we have you know we have Winnipeg next. I'd even put him in there because if you're going to build him as your starter, he's got to be able to play against those good teams. So oh, I think for you've sure. Really got to you got to run him against everybody at this point. Just see how he does. Mm-hmm. I agree, and he's looked extremely good in all of his appearances. So until he starts not playing well, I I'd run with him. Sort of like uh, when the Flames had Johnson and Elliott. Like, Johnson, for, like, the entire month of November, was just on fire. And the Flames just basically started him for, like, a month and a half uh, until he started cooling down, and that's when Elliot started getting back in the, the net again. Well, the, my only worry is we saw last year when Riddick came up, he was very streaky. He'd go on, he'd have really, you know, good streak and then a really poor streak, and I hope that he's worked through that over the summer. It sounds like he thinks he has, but... Um, well, I guess the question is, do we just play him enough until we hit that cold streak and then take him out? Yeah, uh, that's the way I'd do it. But just because of the fact that, like, he only has one year of a sample size in the NHL. So, like, yeah, he had a bad streak when he was the starter last year. But he was also a rookie. And, like, he'd only had, like, I think 10 or 12 games in the NHL at that point when he became the starter. so Yeah, 2016-2017, he played one game for the Flames last year. He had 21 in this year, nine. So not that, not even 50 games yet. No, and he can learn. And, you know, if he continues to play well, you just keep running him out there. And if he gives your team a chance to win, like even if he gives up three goals and the Flames are rolling offensively, like – you can handle that. It's when you're giving up goals like the way Mike Smith has that, you know, you literally just need an NHL goaltender at that point. 
Well, and that's an important thing, too, is, yeah, they're going to lose. And, yeah, he's got to be in the net for some of those losses because a good starter knows how to lose and bounce back the next game. And that's something we often don't see from backups where they can, you know, lose and come back the next game. So I think we need to, as much as I hate to say it, the Flames need to start losing with Riddick in net so we can see how he reacts to that. True. But hopefully not for a while. You know, sometime in March, maybe. Well, I don't know. There's, <laughs> there's some... The, the, like, I could see them losing with him in net against Winnipeg or Dallas. I think those are games that could go either way. Um, Columbus, maybe. But it's it's about how they bounce back. The other thing I'm noticing about the goaltenders, the Flames seem to play a lot better for Riddick. Like, he's, they play like their starters in net. You know, we've seen how many times when we had Kipper as a goalie, teams didn't play for the other guy. Well, it also makes sense just due to the fact that some of the goals that uh, Smith was giving up, it puts you on edge because you don't want to put any shot, allow any shots on net because you don't know, no matter how easy the shot is, if it's going to actually go in. And so you're kind of like gripping your stick a lot because of the fact that you're worried, basically, any of making any mistake because it might end up in your net. And with Riddick, they know that like the easy stuff he's gonna get, and so you just need to worry about like not giving up stupid chances. I'm just looking at the Vegas game. Subban's save percent tonight is uh, point six five zero. So slightly worse than Smith. Just a little bit, maybe, but <laughs> wow, yeah. Um, in interesting site I saw here, moving away from this week's games, I found this site oh, I've probably seen in the past, but really started analyzing it this week. It's called SportsClubStats.com. We'll put the link in the show notes if you want to see it. And there's all sorts of sites that have these predictions of you know playoff probabilities and stuff, but don't tell you how they get to it. And I like this site because they tell you exactly how they calculate everything. So if you're a bit of a stats nerd like I am, uh, you can definitely come and and see this and try it out and see, you know, you can simulate different things here. But I wanted to point out some interesting stats. Um, right now, according to these guys, I won't get into how it's calculated, but the Flames have a 69.3 percent chance of the playoffs this year. They also have a what-if calculator here for total points finished. And looking at this, according to this, the Flames need 93 points uh, to get a 73% chance at a playoff spot. If they get 92 points, they're at 58%. And I don't know about you, that sounds about right to me, Matt. Yeah. Typically, if you're getting more than 93 points, you're in, unless weird stuff happens. Like, sometimes... Uh, certain divisions and that have far too much talent, but you know, uh, the Pacific I don't think can be accused of that. Uh, frankly, I, I wouldn't be shocked if the third uh, Pacific team had 89 or 90 points and got in for how bad yeah. our division is. So, yeah, interesting note there. Just some other things um, to look at, and it's kind of neat if you look at this, is the Flames' chance at the President's Trophy, um, what their chance at Division Seed 1, 1A, 1B, 2, and 3 are, and then their Conference Seed. So it's kind of interesting to see here. For the Flames to even have, let's say, upwards of 50% chance at a President's Trophy, they need 110 points, and then they have a 41% chance at 111 points. 52% chance, so that's not happening, nor were we expecting it. Yeah, it'd be cool, but yeah, the Flames would have to be basically playing at a, you know, basically how they have been, but with NHL goaltending instead of what has happened with Smith. And I think once that gets sorted out, the Flames can move forward in the standings. So if you're a stats geek, check this out, sportsclubstats.com. They've actually got a whole bunch of sports, uh, CFL, soccer, football, baseball, basketball, none of them that we care about. Um, but this one's kind of neat, and you can go through all different teams. You can even do ECHL if you're looking for something different. So check it out. It's kind of a neat thing. works well on your phone if you want to look at it uh, on mobile. And there's also a lottery uh, generator, which, of course, the Flames are nowhere near getting a lottery pick. Yeah. But... Good if you want to see where Edmonton's at. Exactly. If you're a fan of the Oilers, that's for you. 
So speaking of Oilers fans, so I want somebody, if anyone on the listening to the show knows an Oilers fan, okay, I want you to get them to tweet us or call us. I want to know seriously, what is there to cheer for? Like, are you an Oilers fan because well, you grew up in Edmonton and it's what you've been taught? Or is there actually something that we don't see that you're cheering for? Well, the thing, coincidentally, earlier today, I was at Starbucks and at, uh, one of the baristas I know there is an Oilers fan. And like he said that he became a fan because of guys like McDavid and Hall and all that. And yeah, now it's like, uh, why do I even bother watching this team? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Are you a McDavid fan or is there something to be a fan of outside of him? Well, frankly, at this point, not really. Like Everything about the organization seems to be not competently done, so... But they got Ryan Spooner playing the parade. Well, hey, you know, you trade a couple of draft picks and uh, uh, Jordan Eberle, and those draft picks turn into Anthony Beauvillier and Matthew Barzal, and in in return you get uh, Ryan Spooner and a third-round pick at the end of the day. So, you know, those were good trades. Well, let's stop picking on the Oilers. It's always fun to pick on the Oilers. Like... (laughs) I've never, frankly, in, because I do kind of follow all of the sports. Other than the Cleveland Browns, I don't recall any team being as incompetently run as them. Yeah, like they're just horrible. There's rumors coming out of Edmonton that McClellan might lose his job. If he does, do you think that Gullitson gets the reins? Yeah, probably. Do you think Gullitson would hear that he got the job and then look down to see a replay of um, McClellan getting fired? Probably. That was always his thing last year. It's like, dude, look up. You don't need to see everything on replay. Well, I was just glad that the Flames won just because of them beating Gullitson. Because, you know, screw that guy. Anyway. Um, <laughs> here's an interesting piece of, of Flames talk, getting away from the Oilers, that I thought would be interesting. The Flames brought up Ryan Huska as an assistant coach this year. The past couple of years he's been in Stockton and... I think everyone in the Flames organization saw him as a good development coach. I wanted your thoughts on this. How much of the development of Anderson and Valimaki, two of the guys who I think we can all agree have really been, you know, the guys that have developed the most this year. I I don't even add Oliver Shillington into that just because of the fact that he's doing really good in Stockton Yeah, I don't think you could say that our Calgary coach worked with him this year, but for sure in the past. But how, yeah. how much do you think we could directly contribute the rise of Anderson and Valimaki to Ryan Huska, who's the defensive coach? I think a, a fair amount. Like it, It's one of those things where you would not know that Valimaki and Anderson are as young as they are for how good they're playing. Like They've had a couple of bad games, but... Even when they're not good, they're still not, like, horrendously bad. And I think that has a lot to do with the good coaching that they've been receiving. And I think that for Huska, he worked with uh, with Anderson last year in Stockton, so he knows a little bit about probably what makes Anderson tick and how to motivate him. But I have to, you know, it makes you wonder, if we had a different defensive coach, would they be at the same level? I think there's something to be said about the guy who's been the developmental coach for a while coming up and maybe spend a little bit of extra time with those rookies just because that's what he's used to. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if that was the case. And he's done a good job, and I have to give full marks to him for the job that he's done. And the team's getting more composed overall defensively as the season goes on because they're adjusting a bit to a new way of doing things. But the team... Like especially the defensemen have been top notch, frankly, all year, and it's only a couple of games here and there for each of the guys. Like Brody's la or Giordano had a rough-ish game the other day. Brody got his first uh, goal of the year tonight. Yeah, Brody has had a couple of bad games early in the year, but has been great lately. Hamannick's been the best since he's been a flame. And I mean, when was the, the last time the three we, young guys were good? When was the last time we even talked about the Flames' third pairing? I know. Like, normally it's like, oh god, those guys are on the ice. You know, hurry up and get them off. <laughs> but 
Yeah, you know, like, uh, frankly, the third pairing for the Flames has been better than most teams' second pairing for most of the season, and which, considering they're rookies, that's really impressive. But to see what the future of the blue line for the Flames is. Well, talking about rookies, interesting discussion this morning at the media scrum from Bill Peters. Bill Peters acknowledged, I think, you know, we've talked about it a little bit here, and I think Flames fans have wanted themselves, but finally acknowledged by the head coach that the team has to make a decision on Dubé. And he wondered out loud to the media, is it best to keep Dubé here and play him with limited bottom six minutes? Tonight, Dubé's on the fourth line with Jankowski and Hathaway. Or would it be better to return Dubé to Stockton um, and let him play top minutes there? Is that what's going to help his development more? So, you know, we've talked about this in the past. You know my thoughts. I think I would send him down. I'm surprised he's lasted as long as he has. But interesting to hear the coach saying that. And... I don't think as a coach you say that unless you're actually prepared to send him down. And, you know, you, I was going to say you let him play his way out of his, you know, play his way into a lineup spot. But when you're playing on the fourth line, the coach isn't even given him that opportunity. So I think I would say by this time next week, we see Dubé back in Stockton is my guess. Yeah. And that to me is the right move as well. He earned his way into the NHL to start the year, but, He's been just okay since then, and uh, he's taken quite a number of big hits, and uh, like I don't want to see him getting ruined just because he's being rushed a bit. And like, there's no, it's not like the Flames are hurting for talent, so we can be patient with him uh, to an extent and just let him do his thing because he's a very good player, and he will be a top player for us for a while. It's just, he has to get his game going, and I think being on the first line in Stockton would help. So if you if he goes down, would you bring somebody up? I mean, I guess one of the young kids, to me, I would just slot Zarnik into the lineup and bring up Peluso as the extra forward. What about you? I agree, and that's exactly what I'd do. Because Zarnik hasn't played bad when he's been in. So. Well, and if they've kind of relegated Dubé to a fourth-line role, Zarnik's fine for that role. Yeah, exactly. You know, and know. if Zarnik can emerge you know, through his good play, well, that'll be good as well. But, you know, the, it, we just have a bad problem to have. Of We have too many good players and not enough spots. It's such a hard thing to deal with. Well, and, and I've heard some people say... Um... You know, oh, they should bring up Mangiapani, but to me, that's no better. I mean, you're still in that point of having a promising young forward playing. I think Mangiapani definitely, looking at this lineup, gets bot- you know bottom six, not even bottom six, bottom line minutes, fourth line minutes. So I think you got to keep both those guys in the A where they're going to do better. Yeah, and like frankly, with each of those guys, you're looking at them and hoping that like one of them turns into like Calgary's equivalent of Jake Gensel for Pittsburgh, a guy who can slot in on various lines and chip in goals from anywhere. And I think that uh, having them s- being in Stockton and allowing them to just fully develop their offensive game will help them transition into the NHL because we have plenty of guys who can slot in on the fourth line. Like, I think there's nine or ten guys, frankly, that you could slot in on the fourth line, and okay, yeah, you'll do. Who cares? Yeah, and I mean, you know, at that point, especially just just considering, you know, the money and that sort of thing, Zarnik seems like the logical choice. Yeah, and He's not frankly, doing anything spectacular, like, but he's not hurting you. Yeah, exactly. And, like, there's a whole bunch of guys that you could slot in on that 12th forward spot, and they're not going to blow you away, but they're... NHL players, at least, and, you know, they're not going to hurt you, and, uh, like, in years gone by, we've had some fourth-liners that have hurt the team, but that's not the case this year, so there's no real need to rush people, and the Flames can just be patient. Like, when you have the forward group that they do, there's no urgency, whereas, like, before, in years gone by, it's like, Okay, we have like four NHL forwards at the moment. Uh, 
can anybody score? <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, yeah. Dubé hasn't scored yet. He looks like he's in a bit of a funk. I think going to the AHL will give him that time to work with a developmental coach, or like we were talking about earlier, but also to really get his game back and build that confidence. I don't necessarily want to say he gets banished for the rest of the year, but I think for right now, that's the best place for him. I agree. And just let him return to Stockton, and hopefully Stockton themselves as a team can get better and hope that the team can just, you know, start to perform well enough where uh, more prospects are ready for prime time. Well, let's talk a little bit about Stockton, shall we? Sure. Uh, Stockton Heat, the biggest, I guess, story down there is Oliver Shillington. This kid's looking hot. He has 13 points in 16 games and second in overall team scoring. Um, I think after he's tied with Tyler Grailvac now for... 13 points at the top of team scoring. That's impressive for a defenseman. Oh, he was, when he was drafted, like he, the year that he was drafted, he actually had more points in the Swedish league than Eric Carlson did. And that was a down year for him offensively and overall. So like he, he's always been able to generate offense. The main problem that he had was that his defensive game, he tried too much to do everything, and he just it would get into trouble, and he'd make really dumb passes and plays, and that'd lead to breakaways and such. And So he has 13 yeah. points right now, uh, first on the team, like I said, tied, and second in goals behind Kirby Reichel, who has seven. This is another, I mean, we've got two guys up here already. We really don't have room to bring up a third guy, but this is another very promising prospect. Oh, yeah. And I think that you'll see, an, like, eventually he will slot in, and I think that someone will eventually have to go, frankly. You think that's this season? Possibly. It, it just, it Depends on what... I just don't know who you get rid of. I think that you'd probably go the TJ Brody route just because he's set to be UFA sooner than later. But, you know... To me, I'd, I I think we're definitely going to see him called up as the first defensive call-up, but I'm happy with our six right now, even with Stone as number seven. No. I wouldn't move Brody this year unless there's you know an immense value on it. I think that Shillington is a guy who they have to make a spot for next year. Um, and you figure son out then. Yeah, I agree. And we can be patient. Like he he's waiver exempt again next year, so it doesn't really matter, frankly, if the Flames don't have room for him. It's just that he's getting to the point where he's forcing himself into the NHL like Anderson did, and it, that time will come. It's just the Flames are going to have to find a way to make room for him and i think that'll eventually amount to a trade and i'm assuming it'll be like brody for a forward of some kind or a goaltender of some kind but i think it depends if that's done this year or not i could also see this team trading brody pretty much for straight up picks to recoup some of the ones they've lost and yeah you could see like a reverse hamannick deal as well which i think that could make some sense but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I don't think it happens this year. No. Um, especially because Stockton has struggled so much defensively, and I think they need some strong defensemen down there. But uh, Shillington is even on the plus-minus, tied for sixth. But the rest of this team, especially if you look at the defensemen, not doing really well. Like This is a team that's not doing well overall. They're not looking good in the, de in the standings. And if you look at who they've got on defense, um, you know, I mean, their second pairing is... Vasilev and Teramon, Teramona, Teramina, not a great second pairing. Like the only guys really of any consequence are Shillington and maybe Olus Matson. They, re I'm still surprised, honestly, that um, Dalton Prout's up here because they just need somebody. Yeah, that's usually where you get like some lock-on guys or something to, like, hey, you're a veteran who's played around the leagues. You know, hey, you're good enough. Let's go, and. Yeah, they're they don't. That's part of the. Well, that's kind. Of, I mean, that's kind of what we have in Termina and Vasilev. Yeah. Uh, Josh Healy's up there. Who I think's been mostly an ECHL guy, and then they've got some walk-on guy named Rob Hamilton. Yeah. 
But, you know, I mean, it's it's impressive that Shillington and Olus Matson being the only real two prospect defensemen are looking that good. But at what point do the Flames stop carrying two extra yeah. defensemen and just send Dalton Pro back? That could very well happen. I One uh, thing that I, I am expecting with this year's draft is uh, the Flames have three picks for right now in the top three rounds. I'm expecting two of those on a defenseman. Yeah, I think at this point the Flames can't afford to drop any of their top three picks. They've done that so much lately. I think they've got to start keeping them and drafting them. Yeah, and I think defensemen will be where they go because, like, you always take better, best player available, but, uh, like, the, the forward depth is all right in the Flames system, but, like, with Valimaki and Anderson and soon to be Shillington graduating, we literally have nobody else, and that needs to be addressed. Looking at the North Division right now, or sorry, the Pacific Division, the Stockton Heat jumped up. They've played 16 games, uh, the most of any team tied with Colorado in their division. They have eight wins, seven losses, one overtime loss, um, which puts them at... 17 total points. The only teams above them are Tucson and San Jose at 19 and 21. So they're starting to come back a bit. And to me, the most impressive part of this has been the goaltending. Um, we think we're screwed in Calgary. Gillies is hurt. Parsons is hurt. Nick Schneider has been tending net. And Nick Schneider sporting a 1.12 goals against average. 0.962 save percentage in four games since being called up October 30th. Who knew that out of all of the goaltenders, the goaltender of the future was Nick Schneider? Yeah, I don't know if I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> well, hey, good for him, and he's doing what he needs to do, which is put up good numbers. And if he continues to do so, that's how he gets it. Just like Riddick, like Riddick was an afterthought when we signed him. It was like, oh, we signed Daniel Preble. Oh, and his teammate Riddick. Like, it, it was not... There was no fanfare with it. And now Riddick, of course, he just proved that he was that good. And because of that, he eventually earned a spot in the NHL and is now the starting goaltender. And with Schneider, it, you know, hey, he's doing great through four games. Awesome. Keep it up. And if he continues to play well... His stock rises, and he might be an NHL goaltender. I don't know if I go that far. I think if nothing else, um, Mason. I mean, Mason McDonald's getting a lot of time because Schneider's not there in the E. I don't think Mason comes back at the end of this year. I don't think he gets renewed. I think that that's Schneider's job if he can keep playing this way. I mean, he's transitioned better to the A than Parsons did, but I I still think Schneider's got a long way to go to get up this depth chart to the point of being an NHL guy. I agree. It, kind of scary, and, though. Can you imagine if Smitty gets hurt? There's no Gillies to call up, no Parsons to call up. you got to call Schneider up to back up Riddick. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that he, it, with goaltenders, anybody who's under the age of 26, like, it, it doesn't matter to me, like, what their pedigree is because they are so weird that you can't really predict who's going to turn out. Like, nobody would have expected Riddick to be as good as he has been. And could Schneider be a good goaltender in the NHL? Possibly. And uh, they're so unpredictable. I think we see we see a lot of guys come from the European leagues, though, like Riddick, who've played against men. And I think that gives them a bit of a leg up. I agree. And but Schneider has looked good at times. And I and I don't think and I also don't think that Riddick is a no. full time starter either. But Schneider has looked good and hopefully he keeps it up. You know, it'd be good to have a third guy down there that is an option at least. And the more comp competition, the better. And it doesn't hurt. I just find it interesting that the guy you and I looked at at the bottom of the depth chart is the guy saving the farm well, team. Oh, hey, good on him. Yeah, you know, I have nothing but praise for Schneider, and keep it up. And he, if he does, he'll get a shot of showing him what he can do. Whether that's you know an NHL game at some point or whatever, who knows? But it doesn't hurt. 
Yeah, and I mean, even if when he comes back, he gets, I, I don't want to say starting minutes, but it's common to carry a couple of goalies who play a lot in the A. I wouldn't be surprised if they keep him in the A um, with Parsons. Yeah. I don't know what you do with Gillies, but I wouldn't be. I still think that the Flames, I mean, Gillies is hurt again. And I don't think he's durable enough to be an NHL goaltender. So I wonder if you start looking at moving that asset before he gets hurt again. Well, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Gillies comes to the NHL sooner than later. If, like, Smith does not show signs of improvement, I think that that switch will happen. You think they wave Smitty? Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. Wow. If Smith, say, comes at, has another two or three games like the Montreal game uh, over the next few weeks, uh, frankly, yeah, I think you just, okay, have fun in Stockton. And The only thing is Gillies isn't looking great either. Like, I'm not sure one is an upgrade on the other. But you could kind of handle that if the young guy's screwing up because at least he m- might grow. Yeah, I yeah. guess I guess depends how you look at it, right? I, I mean, there's yeah, he might grow, but is he going to grow more on the farm? Yeah, it's one of those where you're kind of in a this is not ideal. <laughs> I think there's also enough teams out there like LA um, who might even be willing to give you something for that young goalie asset right now. He's better. He's got to be better than uh, who they got as their goaltenders. I don't even Peter know Budai, more. Peter Budai, and whoever else. Cal Peterson. Okay. Or the goofy NHL goalies for uh, Edmonton. Their backup is wearing number 19. Doesn't even know what a proper goalie number is. Like He's better than some of these guys, and I can see you're not going to get a lot for him, but I can see them flipping the asset. Yeah. Get a fourth or something like that. Yeah. I mean, if Max Reinhardt can get us a fourth. Well, he didn't actually. It was a conditional fourth, okay. and the condition wasn't met. So. so you make a condition that if Gillies laces up pads again, you get your fourth. Yeah. Um, but I just, I don't know. I think Gillies' big Achilles heel right now is he gets hurt too much. Yeah. And we saw him miss whole season. Now he's out again. If he's getting hurt that much at the HL level, and especially I think that Gillies is a backup for most of his career. If you can't, if you get hurt backing up, your whole job is to, you know, come in in relief. You can't be hurt. Yeah. So we'll see what happens there. Well. Um, anything else before we get into looking ahead that you want to talk about for the Flames? Oh, I think we should check in on the Vegas game after two periods. End of two, and it looks like uh, Subban finally figured out how to save a puck because the Flames haven't scored in ten minutes. It's still 7 nothing. Yeah, and I've been watching the game as we've been doing the show, and Vegas frankly looks completely terrible in every facet of the game right now like the flames are just going through them like swiss cheese and like you you might as well not even have forwards or defensemen on the ice for how bad and porous their defense has been so well like you said i think we're starting to see vegas looking like what we expect from an expansion team yeah and they're not good no, I mean, you know, even with Pacioretty there, I think a lot of fans were getting excited. I think Stasny's there too. I mean, they made some some big name moves. I'd hate to be a guy like Stasny who decided to go there over another team, but you know, it's it's where they're shaking out to be, and I think that it really shows this team need I think this team can be a force in 2-3 years. They've got some pieces, but they need that time like any other team to to get themselves sorted out. Yeah, and I think that a lot of their success last year was just that nobody had a playbook on them. Mm -hmm. And, like, they were all scraps from other teams. Like, none of the players were, not a lot of them were very good individually. And they were just more than the sum of their parts. And now teams have adjusted to that and now they're one of the worst teams in the league. Well, I've also found it interesting in the couple of Vegas games I've watched to see how Flurry looks in front of a bad team. And, you know, I'd have to crunch numbers, but it makes me wonder, is he really the goalie we thought he was? Or was he just, uh, you know, a good enough goalie in front of a great, or behind a great team with a good enough defense in front of him? Yeah, well, I've never been a Flurry fan. And, like, I've always thought he was a, 
frankly a bad goalie that's just happened to play on good teams. I mean, I know I petitioned for him a couple of years ago, and I still think he might have been a better option than Smitty. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think he, I think he was a top goalie because he had a good team in front of him. Yeah, uh, like it, frankly, I think that like if the Penguins had a different goalie than Flurry, I think they have two or three more cups than they do. Yeah. So uh, I, because some of those playoff series, he was the reason they lost. Like, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Now they have a different goalie in Flurry, and they're last in the East. Yeah. Well, glad that the Flames didn't acquire Matt Murray. Jeez, what the heck happened to him? I never thought Murray was a starter. I thought Murray was a decent guy in the same vein that like John Gibson and uh, Frederick Anderson were good guys for Anaheim. Like, just good enough. And yeah, but not a goalie that's going to win you some cups. Yeah, even though he did twice, but... Murray? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, okay. I wouldn't He's... say they rode him. He was on the team. Yeah, well... It'd be like he, was, the... he was their starter in the finals each year, so... Okay, in the finals. But it'd be like if the Flames go to the finals this year, we're not going to say that, you know, Smitty won us that cup. I mean, I think it's... Tell Smitty practice games at a different time so he doesn't show up for it and you know can't hurt us. Yeah. Games at twelve in the afternoon. See you then. How come the lights are off? <laughs> hey, I can see the puck now. <laughs> Send him to you know the the away team when we're at home and then swap him. But yeah. Well, Matt, let's look ahead at the week that is. We'll call this one a win for the Flames tonight. I think. Does that sound reasonable to you? Well, if the Flames give up eight goals in the third period, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. So looking at the week that was, um, my prediction last week was that we win against Edmonton and Vegas, lose to Montreal. You had the exact opposite. So we're going to go another win for me. I'm up 3-1 to one over you so far this year. I know. We're actually being accurate this year between the two of us. I think that's more than we've had in any one season. Well, even the one week that I was being silly and predicted a sweep, I was pretty close. But yeah, um, actually, yeah, I I won the week I predicted a sweep. That was the Buffalo, Colorado, Chicago. So I think this year we're seeing a Flames team that's playing to their potential. So it's a lot easier to judge what they should be doing. Yeah, true enough. Goaltending yeah. aside. Yeah, true enough. You know, I mean, how many times would they get a lead last year and blow it? Or we'd be sitting here scratching our head going, how do we not win this one? There hasn't been a lot of games, to me anyway, so far, that the Flames should have won and didn't. Or, you know, should have lost and did. Or shouldn't have lost and did, I guess. You know, like everything we've won, there's always a couple, but it seems like everything we've won, we deserve to win. Everything we've lost, we pretty much deserve to lose. Well, uh, I'd even say there's a, a three or four games that the Flames probably should have won, but if not for Mike Smith. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, if you play that goalie, you are you know you knew what you were getting there. True enough. But I think even with, say, Riddick, there's been very few games we've played and lost that you know we, we shouldn't have lost or played and won and shouldn't have won. True but, enough. Yeah, I don't know. It's I think, yeah, for sure, Smitty's cost us a few, but the coaching staff knew what they were getting putting him in. Yep. And to his credit, like he deserved the opportunities that he got. It's just... Yeah, and, it's, and good for the... I mean, if this turns out the way we think it's going to, good for the team for making that switch. It's hard to move away from your starting goalie. Well, Matt, let's look ahead. We've got Winnipeg here at the Dome, an 8 o'clock start on Wednesday. Kind of a weird late start for a Wednesday game. Uh, the Flames then play on Friday the 23rd, Black Friday in Vegas, a 4 p.m. start time. But remember, that's Thanksgiving Day in the States, so that's why it's early. And then they go on Sunday to Arizona. That's a matinee 1 p.m. start. Uh, three games on the board, one at home, two on the road. How do you think we do? I'm not too sure. Uh, why don't you go first this time? Sure. I'm going to predict we lose to Winnipeg. We beat Vegas and Arizona. I'll... Uh, swap you the first and the last game. I think we beat Winnipeg and Vegas, and I think we lose to the Coyotes. Interesting. Why do you think that? Uh, I'm liking the Coyotes this year. They're actually playing more to their potential, so which is nice to see finally from them. I think the big challenge of this whole week, either way, is going to be Winnipeg. But I think coming, I agree. Off, coming off a game like they are against Vegas right now. 
I think it'll give them the momentum that they might need to beat Winnipeg, and Winnipeg's not looking great. They're not as good as they should be, much in the same vein that Calgary's not as good as they should be. So, Do you, do you think Riddick plays all three of these? I would. I would too. I think if you want to put Smitty in, you put him in against uh, the other Vegas game, just so you yeah. see different goalies. But I, I, I think you keep running Riddick all month. Yeah. If there's one this month, I put Smitty in for. If I really think I need to, it's L.A. Yeah, I agree with that. Like I, I wouldn't. I'm not saying I would put him in there, but if they really feel like they got to put him back in net, put him in the L.A. game. Yeah, and yeah. After that, there's not really any games. Right not until through. the back-to-back. Yeah. Uh, and even then, like, that one, of course, makes sense. But, like, even after that, like, there, there's not too many good teams for the, the stretch immediately following that. So. Do you go Smitty versus Elliott against Philly? Hey, who can give up more goals? Um, yeah, I know. Final, I... final score, 13-11. I mean, just looking at the <laughs> schedule here, the Flames get a long Christmas break. They have 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th off. I can see, honestly, Riddick pretty much running the schedule until Christmas, maybe getting two two games off. But seeing that they're playing pretty much every other, I think Riddick could definitely run that schedule. Yeah. And I frankly, I'd run him until he starts slowing down. And if he struggles at any point, then swap Smith in for a game. And... See how Smith, like, check in on how Smith's doing. If Smith has a good game, then maybe you even it out a little more. And see how it goes. Like, the game prior to the Montreal game, Smith played well. And against San Jose, even though the, they lost Would you that say game. he played well or well for him this year? Well, the two goals they surrendered, any goalie in the NHL gives those up. So... You know, yeah. the team just didn't play well in front of him. Like, he wasn't the reason they lost that game. So, it made sense to give him the Montreal game just because you're trying to build his confidence and he didn't seize the opportunity. And so, I'd wait until, like, there's a need to put him back in. And if he has a good game, then you give him another one to see if he's finally figuring it out. And if he struggles, then... You go back to Riddick. Yeah, I think you're right. And even if he doesn't, I don't know, even if he doesn't struggle, I think you've almost got to still look at him as the backup until he can start putting two or three, no matter if they're consecutive or not. But it's like, hey, we put you in, you look good. We're going to put Riddick in and we'll come back to you. And I think you've almost got to give him two or three taps, whether consecutive or not, before you put him in full time. I agree. You know, if you say put him against L.A. on the 30th, sit him down for one, two, three, four games, put him back in against Edmonton. He still looks good. Maybe play him against Philly. And then you say, okay, now let's try giving him more. Yeah. And Smith does have, you know, we've been hard on Smith and everybody's been hard on Smith. And I think Smith's been hard on Smith and he has it in him to be a really good goaltender. He was an all-star last year. So like he has it in him. It's just, he has to figure out the magic again. And if he does, then everything's fine and there's no problem. When you say he's got it in him, though, I mean, yeah, he's been an all-star, but, you know, there's a lot of guys that were all-stars and aren't anymore. I think, really, Smitty's run on fumes at this point. I think this is the last year we see him in the league. That could very well happen, but, uh, like, with him, there have been games where there's been flashes of good things, and... Oh, spoiler alert, Vegas just scored. There Broke go, the shutout. There goes the shutout. Uh, but The comeback Smith is was, mounting. Yes. Less than a minute in. Oh, no. Uh, Smith was really good against Nashville in the first week of the season. And there's been a couple of games where Smith was the reason why the Flames won the game. So, he's had flashes of being the goalie he was. It's just it's been occasional flashes instead of any consistency. And more he, often than not, he's been terrible. But you know, when we see guys like that, Matt, those are guys like Cam Ward, guys who are now backups. And I think that honestly, I mean, he's old. Yeah, he was an all-star. So was Ward at one point. But, you know, I think those are the guys that get relegated to backup roles of saying, yeah, you can do this once in a while. Do it once in a while. 
Yeah. You know, you I don't think Smitty can do it 60 games anymore from what we've seen so far. No, neither do I. So hopefully, you know, hopefully he does come around because, you know, I really don't want to see them, as you were saying, send them to Stockton or anything like that. But um, I just, I think that it, the search for a new goaltender is now much more eminent than it was, whether that's Riddick or someone else, but we need two guys there. I think they really need a, to jump on doing that. Yeah, let, and searching for that guy. Well, like frankly, like if say Smith has three more games where he's variations of whatever mediocre game that he's had this year, then I think you're looking at going a different direction entirely, and like you know removing him from the Flames team and just insert any of the young kids and hope that they play better. And I think. Mean- I think too. It's good we're finding this out early. Yeah, I agree. I'd ha- I'd hate to be having this problem down the stretch. True, and at least we have plenty of time to address that, whether it's like a trade or uh, whatever. Yeah, uh, whether it's trade, call up. You know, we can we have time to address it. But if you remember last year, by the time Smitty got hurt and we found someone somewhat capable, it, we it was too late. Yeah. So I, I think it's good that we're dealing with this now as opposed to dealing with this in March. Well, Matt, enjoy this next week of Flames hockey. Uh, I guess it's Black Friday hockey, which isn't something we usually talk about, but maybe we'll get a deal and uh, get a whole bunch of goals on Vegas again. Yeah, that'd be nice. And we will talk to you next week um, for hopefully, let's say, you know, two out of three wins. Thank you for listening, everyone, and have an awesome week, and go Flames go. Go Flames go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.